Assalamu alaikum. Um, very good to see all of you uh, here for this important conversation. Um, my name is Dalia Mugahid, and I am the Director of Research for the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. We're going to go ahead and uh, present some research on um, the perspectives of American Muslims as well as other faith communities on the topic of discrimination and bullying. And then we will invite uh, an, a wonderful panel of experts to help us unpack and understand the results. You can follow us on uh, social media and also please feel free to share any insights or um, nuggets of interesting pieces from this presentation on social media with the hashtag ISPU poll. Before we get started, I'd like For to For more share, than 30 years. Whoop, I'd like to share with you uh, a message from our sponsor, uh, Amana Mutual Fund. Zamana Mutual Funds have provided halal investment vehicles serving the unique needs of the Muslim community. Discover how you can align your investments with your principles in a retirement, health, or education savings account, or invest for Hajj. To obtain this and other important information in a prospectus or summary prospectus, please visit www.amanafunds.com or call toll-free 1-800-732-6262. Please read the prospectus and consider an investment's objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. The Amana funds limit the securities they purchase to those consistent with Islamic principles. This limits opportunities and may affect performance. Okay, so what we'll do today is first just go through our, uh, our our goal, our purpose for this poll, why it's so important, why it's so relevant. Um, then next, we'll go through the methodology of how we conducted the poll so you understand where the numbers came from. And then we'll dive into the key findings and then finally um, discuss the findings with our panel and then open the floor for Q&A. So first, why this poll? The first thing we wanted to do when we were thinking through doing this poll, first, it's uh, the fifth annual ISPU poll. So we started doing a survey of American Muslims, American Jews, as well as Americans of other faith and non-faith communities starting in 2016. So this year is actually our fifth annual ISPU poll. And it was going to be such an important historical survey because not only is it a five-year trend, but it was um, right before an incredibly important election. But we didn't realize just how historic this poll would be uh, because we went to field right as the COVID-19 pandemic was um, becoming, uh, you know, something that people were, were aware of, you know, in a mainstream way. So we went to the field in mid-March until mid-April, right as the lockdown was happening. And we were able to therefore take a snapshot of how people felt at this, this unprecedented time of a global pandemic. It was also only several months before historical protests demanding uh, racial justice in the United States. So we were, we were able to really capture this moment amidst pandemic and protest in the United States. Now our methodology, we for the past five years have been working with a polling firm, really a preemptive polling firm called SSRS. They conduct polling for CNN, CBS, ABC, The Washington Post, and many other um, top media uh, outlets. Their, the sampling and weighting was led by Jonathan Best and he is their Vice President for Advanced Scientific Methods. He's a longtime member and presenter at APOR, the American Association of Public Opinion Research, and he's also a member of the American Statistical Association. So as far as our specific methodology, first, all participants in our poll were given identical surveys. So, uh, 
the sample of Muslims and Jews and um, the general public were all given exactly the same survey. Our sample of Muslims was a little over 800 uh, respondents, which um, are taken from a nationally representative sample. Uh, we have nearly 400 Jewish respondents. And then what we do is um, compile uh, a, uh, a sample of the general public, right? So it's 1200 of the general public that is broken down by the major faith groups. So we have Catholic, Protestant, then a subgroup within the Protestant community. We look at white evangelicals. We also look at people who don't identify with a faith, non-affiliated Americans. And the survey uh, was fielded, as I mentioned, March 17th until April 22nd. And you can read more about our methodology and, and all of our findings at ispu.org forward slash poll. We also had a, a wonderful and very um, distinguished panel of advisors. And uh, these folks, many of them have been advising us from the beginning, but really the top names in both American Muslim polling um, but also just uh, the study of Islam in America. So what I'm going to focus on today is just discrimination and poll, uh, discrimination and bullying, but the poll covered many other topics. So some of the key findings from the overall study were first, Muslims are making gains in voter registration, but they remain lower than other groups that we studied. Uh, political leanings predict preferences for coalition building and religiosity does not. And, and that's something uh, that we discussed last week at our webinar. For the general public, political ideology and party affiliation predicts Islamophobia, while again, religiosity is not a factor. And then what we'll be focusing on today, Muslims are more likely than other groups to experience religious discrimination in institutional settings. So specific to the key findings on discrimination and bullying, just zeroing in on the topic of discussion for today. For Muslims, experience with religious discrimination remains high. It's been high since we started measuring it in 2016, and it has not changed. It is actually constant um, throughout that time period. Muslims are more likely than other groups to experience religious discrimination, especially in institutional settings versus individual settings. And finally, half of Muslim families that have kids in the K through 12 school system report that their child has experienced religious-based bullying. And that's twice as likely as the general public. So some other topics that our poll has covered, but uh, will not be covered today, and some we will be uh, releasing at uh, later times. We, we looked at um, the views of divorce in the Muslim community and in other faith communities. We looked at me mental health and su suicidality, uh, religious literacy, media consumption, faith and religiosity, experience and views uh, with addiction, as well as accommodating and respecting uh, people with disabilities. So specific to discrimination and bullying, what did we discover this year? The first thing is that the majority of Muslims and Jews report experiencing some frequency of religious discrimination. Um, so the question is how often, if at all, have you experienced uh, discrimination in the last year because of your religion? And um, the, for the Muslim community, 60% say that they've experienced it in some frequency. Um, interestingly, this year, Jewish Americans were on par with Muslims in saying that they also experienced some frequency of religious discrimination. Um, now, what's, uh, if you look at other faith communities, um, the other, the next biggest group is actually white evangelicals who, uh, who also report um, an elevated level of religious discrimination. Now, what makes Muslims unique um, is not that they're experiencing high levels of discrimination, you know, by itself, but the kind of discrimination that they've experienced. So if you look at over time, so the past five years, 
it's been an, uh, a surprisingly constant number all five years, despite the fact that these are fresh samples every year. We're not like asking the same people year after year, but a fresh sample that is representative of the community every year. And yet you, you always have around 60% of American Muslims saying that they have experienced some frequency of religious discrimination in the year before. Um, for the Jewish community, it's kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit, and it, the highest we've seen has been in, two, in 2020. So what, where are folks experiencing religious discrimination? For the first time this year, we were able to actually, you know, ask the follow-up question, ask a second question regarding where is this happening? Um, Muslims were more likely than others to experience institutional religious discrimination. So what we did is when someone said that they had experienced some frequency of religious discrimination, we asked them uh, the follow-up questions of where it occurred. And they could pick um, as many as applied. So it's not like if you got discriminated at, uh, against in the airport that it wasn't gonna also happen at a job. So you could choose as many as applied to you. And what we found is that for Muslims, um, they, though frequency of just general religious discrimination was about the same between American Muslims and American Jews, where it occurred and how it occurred was very, very different. So for Muslims at the airport, um, nearly half of Muslims said that that was where um, their religious discrimination occurred. About a third said that it was when they were applying for a job. Interacting with law enforcement was another around a third and then a quarter um, receiving healthcare services. And you can see that um, compared to the Jewish community or the general public, again, amongst people who say they've experienced some level of uh, some frequency of religious discrimination, it's far lower. It's not happening as often or even close to as often in institutional settings, um, at least these institutional settings for other communities. Now, when you look at interpersonal religious discrimination, um, is it, you know, the public, someone, says something to you in a public place or a coworker says something or even a friend says something to you that's like a microaggression. That's where other communities are a little closer, a little more um, similar to Muslims. So Muslims were uh, more likely to experience interpersonal religious discrimination in the public work and school versus um, uh, interacting with friends in terms of compared to other uh, other communities. So here interacting with strangers in a public place, nearly half of those who had experienced it, that is where they experienced it. Still higher than um, the other groups, but a little more comparable. Um, interacting with peers at work or school, again, 42% of Muslims, 22% of Jewish Americans and 24% of the general public. And here's where things were a lot closer, interacting with friends and family. About a third of all three groups, um, roughly, had um, experienced it in, in that kind of interpersonal setting. <clears throat> so um, interestingly, where, where Muslims are unique is that their experience of religious discrimination is happening at, you know, at the hands of the state, much more than other communities, where even if they do experience it, it is more likely to be an interpersonal issue than something where they're being targeted by the state. Now, bullying, uh, you know, discrimination doesn't just uh, microaggressions uh, because of your faith, Islamophobic discrimination and targeting doesn't just impact adults, it also impacts children. Um, and we, we asked this question in 2017 and uh, again in 2020 and, and really the, you know, people will ask, has it gone up or down? And the answer is it's basically stayed about the same. So um, Muslim families were twice as likely as the general public to say their kids had been bullied for their faith. So 51% compared to 27% of the general public. And this is among families that have um, children in uh, the K through 12 school system. Now, what always alarms us, and this happened the first time we asked, 
<coughs> is we'll, we'll ask a follow-up question if someone says they, their child has been bullied and we ask them who was the bully. Uh, and they can also choose, you know, it could be two different sources, three different sources, however many sources that uh, apply. But 30% of those who were bullied say that the bully uh, included a teacher or administrator. So it's not just children, but adults uh, as well that are um, that are potential, uh, you know, sources of, of, uh, of bullying for Muslim children. So now I'd love to um, invite our, um, I'll just stop sharing my screen so we can have a bigger, but I'd love to invite our panel now to, uh, to join us. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, I'm, we're going to be uh, putting everybody's bio and um, and job title in, in the chat. So please learn more about our panelist by clicking on their bio. I'm gonna start with you, Minar. Uh, as a legal expert at the, at the ACLU, what do you think was the most significant finding in, in this study, especially regarding um, individual versus institutional discrimination. Sure, thank you so much for having me um, and for producing this research and data that's relevant to our communities. You know, for as long as I've been doing this work, there's just never, we just never have data for our communities. And I'm so grateful to ISPU for always making this a priority and putting it forward because we would quite honestly wouldn't have it without you all. Um, I am bad at following instructions, so I'm going to highlight a few things that, um, <laughs> that I think are really important about this data. So, I mean, the first one I'll say is, you know, in the FBI data on hate crimes, which is, which, which comes out every November for the year before, we actually saw a slight decline in hate crimes last year, like, which would be the 2017, 2018 year. And I think that that reflects that our communities are probably reaching out to law enforcement less than they were before, not that hate crimes weren't occurring. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really interesting about the religious discrimination findings, although that is obviously different than hate crimes, these are all interconnected issues. And we see that religious discrimination is holding at roughly the same rate um, year after year. And Muslims are experiencing this discrimination at the highest rate compared to most other communities, right? And then we see that bullying has also like increased just slightly negligibly, but it's not going away, right? And I think all of that is a reminder that it's that validation that we don't have without the data that yes, our communities are actually experiencing a lot of this and it's not going away. And also that our communities may not be reporting it for I think pretty obvious reasons in terms of like what our relationships with law enforcement have been, but also who we are as Muslims, right? Like the highest population of Muslims in the United States by race is are black. And what does that mean when we're thinking about protections in when we operate in systems that are centered on law enforcement in this society? So that's one thing. Another thing that I'll highlight is that, you know, the fact that Muslims are facing institutional discrimination at higher rates than other people, as compared to more privately, where it's a lot more even. Um, and then on top of that, the fact that men and women in Muslim communities are kind of evening out in their experiences around discrimination, which we haven't seen before, it makes me wonder if the attacks that we're seeing, the discrimination, the harassment, the hatred are more tied to what people look like in this climate, right? And so you're seeing them more in kind of these overt settings. And again, going back to who are Muslims, mostly black and brown people, though not entirely, but that's but we are, you know, we are, we might be being targeted for a variety of reasons in this context. Um, and then of course I'll say like the fact that children are experiencing um, bullying at this high rate. And then also that so much of that is coming from teachers and school officials. I can't say that that is surprising to me because anecdotally we hear, I hear a lot of that, but I think our youth, especially compared to when I was growing up are experiencing a level of hate that is so empowered that is shaping their psyches and their growth and we have to find better tools for accountability. Um, and then the last thing I'll say that's a little bit 
broader than the data itself is that um, it's a, I think it's a really big reminder of how interconnected all of this work is, right? So at the ACLU, I work at issues that impact Muslim, Arab, Middle Eastern, and South Asian communities, which is a ton of different issues from immigration to national security counterterrorism, hate crimes, um, a little bit of free speech. And the reason that I work on this range of issues is because they all intersect and we can't really help our communities or advocate against discrimination, harassment, um, and hate if we don't understand all of the pieces that we are facing and understand that, for example, an individual may be afraid to report a hate crime because of like police brutality. They may be afraid, they might also be an immigrant, right? So they may be afraid of immigration enforcement. They may be being pressured by the FBI at, in exchange for something around the immigration status of somebody in their family. And so all of these pieces like build together into our experiences and rhetoric from officials, discriminatory policies, television and media, they all play a role in what we experience in our daily lives and how people see us, treat us, um, connect with us and are able to protect us. And so if we're not working to address all of those pieces simultaneously, we can't address the issues because they all continue to prop each other up. And I think the first piece of that is actually the data and understanding what is happening within our communities because we can't rely on a lot of the, the kind of like agency, federal government based data. And so that's why this is so critical. Thank you so much, Mara. And I really, I'm really glad that you highlighted the piece about how interconnected this stuff is because that's exactly what we found when we look at Islamophobia, that it is incredibly interconnected. Um, you know, some of the strongest predictors of Islamophobia, for example, are anti-Black racism or anti-Semitism. Both, um, you know, if someone expresses those views, they are far more likely to also be uh, the endorse anti-Muslim tropes. And so it, you're absolutely right. This can't be solved in isolation at all. Um, the other point I wanted to highlight in what you said is, you know, you mentioned that this year we we did see that unlike previous years, there was no gender difference. And we normally see a gender difference in our discrimination um, data. You know, people, women are, are far more likely, not far more, but significantly more likely in previous years to say that they've experienced religious discrimination. And we had always attributed that to the wearing of the hijab because you know, you're more visible, so that would make sense. But one year we actually asked our respondents if they wore a visible religious symbol. And what was surprising to us um, is that though the women that, you know, still there was a gender difference that year and women were more likely to say they were gender, you know, they were uh, discriminated against for their faith, the ones who said they had a visible symbol were not more than the ones who said they didn't wear a symbol, which was really surprising to me. And I had and then I talked to some, you know, women who don't wear hijab and they were telling me all kinds of stories of discrimination and microaggressions despite not wearing, you know, or, you know, not having that like visible, visible symbol that we think of that there's, there's a racialization and a gender aspect that's beyond just wearing hijab, which I didn't know until that data came out. Um, so thank you very much for pointing that out. I, I did think it was significant that even things like the airport, uh, women and men were similar that they were as, you know, Muslim women are now as likely as Muslim men to face, you know, religious discrimination at the airport and so forth. It, it is not, it is not just men um, who are targeted in that way. So uh, let's uh, now uh, turn to you, Tahira. Um, you've been working with Muslim communities and congregations and mosques specifically, which is oftentimes where we really feel you know the concentration of state and institutional islamophobia can you elaborate a little bit about what you've observed and how it relates to the research oh for sure and i just want to echo Lenar's comments that the work done by ispu is vitally important to validate the experiences that so many muslims have individually and um, the way Islamophobia, just like any form of abuse works, is that when the victims are isolated, they are weaker, 
but when their stories are told and are published, they are stronger and braver. And for sure, I've represented uh, at least two distinct Muslim communities in dealing with not only um, the policies that have been exacted upon Muslim Americans, particularly post 9-11, but we know that those policies of abuse and surveillance, mistreatment and dehumanization have existed since the inception of this country and before. But um, the, the interesting thing that I've, I've dealt with is in, in addition to challenging those policies and calling them out for their Islamophobic nature and impact is on the other hand, representing Muslims as they are victims and witnesses in, in plots and crimes, hate crimes that have been, um, have been occurred, have occurred against them themselves. So that puts us in a really interesting relationship. So on one hand, we're working with law enforcement to help defend and assert the rights of the Muslim victim. And on the other hand, we recognize that law enforcement is responsible for carrying out policies that include extreme surveillance of Muslim communities and engaging with Muslims as, a, as a suspicious. And I, I think that this is a what comes first, the chicken or the egg sort of conversation. Uh, why is it that we are victimized the way that we are? Well, isn't it because our government has sort of created a culture that we are worthy of suspicion, that we cannot be trusted, that if you see something, say something. And that is why someone throws a, a soda bottle at the step of the mosque. That is why someone pulls off the hijab of a woman. That is why three people are killed in their home by someone who sees them as less than humans because he claims that they had no right to park in a parking spot. Why do we feel that Muslims that live upstate New York in a small little community are, are, are the targets of, of groups of people who think they must undertake vigilante justice because maybe the government isn't doing enough? It is because for the past 20 something and more so years, the government has told American citizens that Muslims are here only to be surveilled, to be questioned, and to not be trusted. And it is very, very hard to navigate those relationships with law enforcement, with your neighbors, with the general public, with members of the media, when oftentimes they won't allow you to be anything other than a bad guy, when in fact the statistics bear out, you are more frequently the victim. As you were speaking, I uh, what came to mind is is the fact that it is your as you said, law enforcement is the both <laughs> the the uh, source of a lot of this uh, suspicion, the source of the surveillance, the source of the targeting, but at the same time, they're the ones that people have to call when something happens. And what I always what I'm always reminded of is that. Um, you know, CVE is often po positioned or cast as a way to engage the community against hate crimes. And so the in is always like, well, you know, this is about engaging communities to protect you from hate crimes or online predators for your children. And so people are like, oh, well, that's great. You know, why wouldn't we want that? But it sort of morphs into a completely different kind of engagement. Do you find that the fact that we are both victims and villains at the same time kind of creates the conditions for law enforcement to be able to do that? Oh, for sure. And um, I mean, we're talking about this now, like these issues have been pushed to the Overton window, but like, let's be very direct about what it is that we're talking about. We're talking about policies and laws that further and protect white supremacy. And anytime you have policies and laws that do that, they are by their nature Islamophobic, xenophobic. They just are, whether it's the Patriot Act, whether it's anything, CVE, anything that seeks to protect white fragility 
and protect the idea of white supremacy and dehumanization of those who've been excluded will by its nature always seek to harm, harm Muslims, black and brown people and immigrants 100% of the time. And so, yes, it is hard, I'm assuming, for the typical member of law enforcement to figure out what on earth to do with that. But what we always have to do as a community, as a Muslim community, is we have to hold space for both things to be true, that we have to question policy right to the face of law enforcement, our local district attorney's office, our local US attorney's office, while also demanding our rights and to be protected and to talk about and name um, abuse that we suffer as Muslims. We have to do both at the same time. It is an and, it is a both and, not an and or. It's not an either or. Thank you so much. Sonia, turning to you, um, as you saw, ISP data shows that American Muslims experience discrimination both at the interpersonal and the institutional level. Can you elaborate a little bit more about how Muslims experience discrimination in the workplace? Yes. Um, and, did, and did these numbers surprise you? Um, I, I guess the institutional discrimination surprises me that it is so intense still. First of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me to this panel. And I really enjoyed hearing Manar's and Tyra's opinion. And I think Manar, your point about the intersection of race and religion is an important one because we always forget that when we look at Muslims, it is actually, you know, tied into that. Um, and also Tyra, your um, just the role that government plays in the current administration in perpetuating a lot of this institutional discrimination um, also kind of just answer some of the questions why this exists, why do we have these problems? Um, so in my research, I focus specifically on Muslim women in the workplace. It's a very specific <laughs> niche that I picked, uh, primarily those who wear the headscarf. And what I what I've been really uh, trying to look at is um, the experiences of these women from very different angles. One is just, um, you know, internally, what do they think about their job prospects um, in terms of their confidence in getting work? Uh, and then I look at the other side, which is the work uh, employers and, um, you know, whether they are going to actually employ, what are the things that they do and look for when they're interacting with uh, Muslim applicants. Um, so the, in terms of the interpersonal discrimination part or what we would like to call as there's many names for it, it's subtle discrimination, it's the modern day racism or microaggressions, um, it's kind of harder to um, defend because not everyone understands the impact that it can have on your lives, right? So if someone says derogatory comments to you, makes uh, ridiculous statements about your headscarf and whatnot, it's very easy because you can go to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you have the Title VII, you can point to it as saying that's discrimination. But when someone says uh, just odd things uh, that are not necessarily directly about your religion, but you kind of perceive that it is, it's kind of harder to defend as a Muslim woman yourself in trying to unpack what is going on here. So that's actually the nature of what I try to study in my um, research. Um, so what I look at in terms of interpersonal discrimination uh, in the workforce, in terms of just applying for work, uh, we go in there and we record interactions of how much eye contact was made, how many words were spoken, uh, and then how many negatives uh, versus affirmatives in terms of yay or nays or just positive or negative words are used. And we code for all of this. We code for the distance uh, between the employer and the person who's applying for the job in a headscarf. Um, we code for just overall general negativity, um, awkwardness, uh, which again is very subjective, right? Because you might say, and that this is why it's so hard to combat it because a lot of people perceive it as to be subjective. So what we are trying to do is trying to make it more quantifiable by having observers also watch this interaction to say that, uh, Dahlia, this is not just in your head. It's a real thing that's happening. Other people are seeing it as well. Um, so what we are doing is we're trying to unpack all of these uh, microaggressions that go on and what we find is that there is a difference. Uh, unfortunately, the difference is just not interpersonal. It's formal discrimination as can, which your data does support. It's like literally people are getting stopped at the airport or people in our data, people are less likely to get called back, women who wear the headscarf. Uh, Muslim women are even less likely to get a, a job application. You know, you go up there and you say, oh, do you have an application I can fill out? They're less likely to be even given that form versus someone who does not. Uh, Unfortunately, that problem exists, which I think is actually a bigger problem, but the microaggression is also an important one because it does have, um, 
it, it does lead to like health issues. It leads to a lot of psychological problems down the line because you perceive something is in your head. Uh, and our research shows that it is there, uh, even when observers look at it, uh, you know, who, who have no bias, they're just seeing this as a video. They're seeing this uncomfortableness, this awkwardness, where people make awkward statements. It's not directly related to your headscarf, not directly related to your religion, uh, but it's just this subtle, um, you're different. You're different and you're not necessarily what we want in the workplace. Um, so I think th uh, that's a line of research that I do. And um, I think it's a very important one because more and more people, um, although this last four years have been different, <laughs> but with more and more, uh, it's been the case that people are smart enough, like uh, legally, they're smart enough to know you're not supposed to say certain things. Although I know you guys have evidence otherwise and we see it all over the news. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, people, employers don't engage in those type of outright discriminatory practices or they shouldn't because they know there's um, lawsuits and repercussions. Uh, but there's no there's no legal guideline for how much eye contact an employer has to make. There's no legal you know repercussion for how many words you said to the person or how far away you stood. Um, so I think there's a lot to examine there, and I think this speaks to some of the data you talked about in terms of interpersonal discrimination. Maybe people are perceiving these things, um, and they're saying like, "Hey, this stuff is happening," and then other groups maybe are not perceiving it to that level because biases, unconscious or uh, outright biases, exist, and people feel comfortable or uh, expressing these, uh, or they might not even know they're engaging in these, right? So you might just feel a certain sense of awkwardness around a person because of stereotypes you might've had. Uh, you've never had been able to undo those stereotypes or never been consciously confronted with them, but here you come across a person who's from a different, um, um, not a race but religion or maybe an intersection or both and how do you deal with that, right? So you yourself, you might think of yourself as very egalitarian, but you, might be socially giving off weird and awkward cues to these people. Um, so I 100% agree with the data that interpersonal uh, you know, discrimination is really profound for this community. Um, and I think it's something that should not be ignored. A lot of researchers, there's this whole thing about like microaggressions, this is just sensitivity or people just being sensitive or is it a real thing? I think it's a, it's, it's a very real thing. Uh, it's not even just that I think, I know it's a real thing people have, um, reported um, just a lot of like psychological issues uh, like low confidence as a result of it because you're always battling with is it me is it them oh, but I feel this thing um, and just trying to uncover that the mechanisms of why this is happening is very important for people um, to study and for people uh, for your polls to show that it exists it's a real thing that's happening. Thank you Sonia you know I just to kind of uh, go back to the data just to confirm what you're saying, where 33% of people who have experienced discrimination in the Muslim community say that it was when applying for a job. Um, it was 42% that said it was when interacting with peers at work or at school. So they're not mutually exclusive. It could be both, but it's interesting that the interpersonal is like slightly more frequent than, than like the formal applying for a job. Um, especially because a lot of times you have no idea why you didn't get called back. It's not, you know, you think it's just you. Um, whereas those microaggressions may be things that are a lot clearer to folks when, when they occur. And I, I think the, you know, the idea of the psychological impact of that kind of work environment, especially when it's very subtle where you can't point to it or you can't, you know, it's not a lawsuit, it's not a law, but it's just the way you're being in a very subtle way treated is really important to, to quantify. So I really commend you for your work. Um, you know, I've worked in corporate, you know, the corporate environment um, as, a, as a young engineer after I graduated and I was, you know, dressed just like I am now. And I, I remember that um, I was the only one, you know, who looked like I did in, you know, the, in a huge company, ginormous company, I was the only one. And I, I just remember that the the weight of um, being like perceiving myself to be such a representative was really crippling and very difficult, especially when you don't really understand what's going on or you are having trouble just like as a human being, as a new graduate, you're trying to adjust to a new work environment and then you sort of um, don't wanna ask a question because you don't wanna look bad or you don't wanna look 
or, or like a reinforces stereotype or whatever. And so this idea of this constant rethinking um, where other people don't have that burden perhaps uh, is, is something that I think we need to study more. So um, let's go ahead and uh, open up the, the floor for Q&A. So all the folks that are watching us uh, online, um, please submit your questions and we'll start to take them here. Okay. Okay, so first question is, where did the Jewish community or the general public experience discrimination? How should I understand that table? So it's a good question. Um, you know, the because what you find is that all the question, all the places that we offered people to choose from, uh, whether it's interpersonal or institutional, it never went, you know, above fifty percent. So where are they? Where are they experiencing it? I can't really answer that question. Um, we are we focused on the American Muslim community, and other folks are sort of. Uh, you know, we, we ask everyone the questions and we have a comparison group. We are not experts on discrimination against Jewish people. So I actually can't answer your question about where it's happening because if it's not happening at all these places institutionally and it's not happening with friends and it's not happening with, at work, I don't know. I don't know where it's happening. It's a really good question and uh, it's not one that we can readily at, answer right now unless someone in the in the panel would like to take a stab at it. Okay, uh, another question. Has ISQ ever found a correlation between US interventions in Muslim majority countries and instances of interpersonal and, inst and institutional discrimination against Muslims here in the US? So it's a really good question and we've never been able to like quantify, I guess the way you're describing, but what we do know is the following. First, we know that public opinion of Muslims in terms of connecting Islam and violence does spike around both election cycles and in the run up to war. So when the US is trying to, when the US government is like manufacturing consent for say the Iraq war, the rhetoric against Muslims and violence will, will uh, go up and then the public will associate violence and Muslims more during the run up to wars and not after actual terrorist attacks. So I think it's very interesting when um, public opinion spikes, anti-Muslim public opinion spikes, it's not immediately following a, you know, a terrible event that um, someone does in the name of Islam or, or with a Muslim identity, it's actually, completely tied to the rhetoric of government officials in either in an election cycle or in the drum up, drum up to war. The other thing though that we know is that endorsing anti-Muslim tropes is associated with uh, wanting to attack Muslim countries or consenting to it or thinking it's a good idea. And it's also linked to accepting the targeting of civilians by military. So all of these things are very intertwined. The more the public endorses these tropes, the more they consent to the government doing these things in their name. And if I could just add like an, an example to that too. I mean, I think it's a it's such a circular problem. And if mm -hmm. you think about like in 2015, when the attack in San Bernardino happened and the attack in Paris happened, what you saw was a congressional response that was completely misaligned with what had actually happened and what they ended up doing. So they took the Congress talked about like actually just cutting our entire refugee system. That was what was on the table. No correlation between the it's a it's a political response based in fear to make people feel more comfortable, even though there's no connection between what they were proposing and what had actually happened. Ultimately, in order to save the refugee system they created this um, this like kind of discriminatory infrastructure around a particular immigration program that prevented people from seven countries from um, coming to the US through a, through a particular program. They could come other ways, but not through this one program called the Visa Waiver Program. Those seven countries became the first Muslim ban countries. And so that's kind of how like these discriminatory systems are set up through a political response that has little to do with what they are actually responding to. 
And Dahlia, may I jump in also? Yeah, absolutely, it, it's also it, it's also important to remember that as you're gearing up towards war and you're trying to secure the support of the American people, you're doing the rah, rah, rah cheerleading. You're trying to increase patriotic uh, uh, loyalty. And no matter what or who you're aiming for, as Americans or people in America, you are being called on to support your country's decision to go to war without question. And so, you're dragged into this uh, idea that it is patriotic of you to get behind whatever foolishness is about to go down in the name of sort of securing your own place as a good law-abiding American. So definitely there, you're, you're called on, uh, on, on in terms of the loyalty that you have to your country and it's an unfair conflation. It's that whole, you're either with us or you're against us and there's yeah. nothing in between. Can, I, can I add a uh, psychological underlying mechanism here? It's called mortality salience. Um, so anytime you have uh, terrorist activities or activities, you know, even just it's very insular and isolated, it, it becomes uh, um, highlight, heightened in us, this mortality salience, like it becomes a us versus them. Um, so what I see here is what you're giving us the data, but I see the psychological undertones is that there's a real there, there's a theory out there that kind of explains what happens when we experience this, uh, when other people see this and all of a sudden it becomes this outsider versus insider and we're gonna defend everything at all costs and what we believe in. Thank you so much. I love uh, all the interdisciplinary discussion around this. Um, you know, from the data perspective, we we do find that Islamophobic tropes and endorsing them are correlated with violence, right? So uh, tolerance for violence, tolerance for uh, targeting civilians, whether by a military or even by an individual or small group, there's a greater tolerance if your Islamophobia index is higher, if you're um, endorsing anti-Muslim tropes. So there's that, that us versus them. The second thing is a tolerance for authoritarianism. So what you said Tahira, is absolutely what we find is that when you're afraid, when you're endorsing these tropes and you're buying into them, you're more likely to let the government you know, take away your own rights, take away the right of free speech, uh, freedom of the press, as well as um, freedom of assembly. And then finally, and this is more obvious, um, anti-Muslim policies that target Muslims by the state, surveillance and the Muslim ban. So it's it's very interesting that all of these different disciplines come to basically show that what fear does is it hurts both security and freedom. Um, okay, so there's a question that's sort of a follow-up uh, asking if she could find the data that correlates between increased Islamophobia and the run-up to war. And we can put the, um, the link to that. It's an article actually that I wrote in the Islamic Monthly that um, we can link to um, in, the, in the chat. So that is where that you can reference that. Um, in, the, in the time that we have left, I just love to get kind of closing remarks on um, what is the call to action by all three panelists to in the upcoming year, especially with this pivotal uh, election coming up to combat discrimination and bullying. And uh, I'll start with you, Manar. Darn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think especially thinking about the election, right? I think it's it's important for us to remember like things have very much escalated for our communities and for black and brown communities writ large under Trump, but we had a lot of these problems before. They were not at the surface and they were not, um, we didn't necessarily have a president that was empowering that level of hatred. Like Sonia, to your point about how these things were kind of under the surface, things were, there were certain things that were not okay to say, right? And we're no longer in that world. Um, I remember being in that world in college and being so sick of people being what we called PC at the time. I don't know if people still even know what that means, but like, it was like people were politically correct all the time. So they knew what they could and could not say. And we were like, we were all like, oh, we wish people would just say what they thought so we would know who they really are. 
I don't want to know who people really are anymore. <laughs> I would like to go back to a world where we knew that that was wrong and it was like under the surface. So I'm not one of those people that, that feels grateful that it's all come out to the surface um, because I think there is no right or wrong anymore. And so for me, the big piece of this is that we cannot let up. Like, regardless of what the outcome of this election is, these discriminatory policies have to be undone, not just for what happened under Trump, but for everything that set that set that infrastructure in place before to allow for it, right? And so it has to be the policies, it has to be the rhetoric, um, it has to be in like television and media, like we need to be pulling all of the levers all of the time in order to be able to move ourselves forward. And that's not to say that it's gonna happen overnight. We've got a long way to go to get back to where we were, let alone to move forward. But if we don't, if we don't fight for it, and if we like kind of go back into our silos and like don't have the uprising that we have had for the last four years, we will lose a lot of those battles before we start them. Sonia, would you like to go next? Sure. Um... So I echo most of Manar's sentiment as well. Um, I think there is there is something to be said about civility and a return to civility. I think we all crave it a lot more <laughs> these days and we really would appreciate it. Um, but I, I just like Manar, I think there's just so many layers to address. There's just so many. There's the institutional, uh, organizational, and even at the interpersonal level, right? There, there are people who hold stereotypes. Uh, where do you start with all of that? And then there's the... Um, overarching like kind of national cultural stereotypes we just have out there uh, that are perpetuated by the media or movies or just even like our friends or someone might say something that we might not necessarily believe but it somehow gets embedded into our psyche as like a stereotype that we kind of know about and then maybe when we're low in resources we might even act out on these uh, stereotypes because they're just a go-to and easy to uh, but I, I think just uh, more understanding and more um, I think your your role as ISPU, I really I really appreciate that. I think you guys do a great service. Uh, you do polls, you disseminate that information. I think this is a starting point. It's just talking about and someone measuring this and just um, unpacking all of these things and or even research I do and you the things that all of the panelists do here, right? It's just a starting point of just addressing like hey, this is real stuff, people experience it. Uh, and from there, what can we do about it? Um, so I think very first is just acknowledging uh, rather than saying, oh yeah, this is a perfect world. We all get along, come by, yeah, it's not that way, right? So I think the uh, starting point would be just starting to address all the atrocities that are happening um, in, in America today. Well, one of the, thank you so much, Sonia. First, I mean, I'm really glad that both uh, everyone has said um, it's very kind of you, these affirm affirmative words about the importance of data. But one of the things we really want to do and aim to do is to make the conversations that are happening well-informed. So if folks are saying, oh, you know, kids aren't getting bullied or that's just one kid or that's just one person and they're, you know, whatever's in their mind, we just need good objective data to assess whether or not that's the case. And so um, it, it will, it is always, we're not direct advocates, but what we do is produce the research so that folks who are making change on the ground have the tools, have the information they need to make well-informed decisions. So uh, I'll turn to you, Talhera. For sure. And as a lawyer, of course, a lot of what I do is, is, is dependent upon information, statistics, and, 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 and you cannot, we cannot underestimate the value of, of the work that ISPU does and its impact on solving and addressing some of the issues facing the Muslim community. I feel that a, a deep, for me, where do we go from here? There's, I have an intense sense of urgency in my heart around making sure that I am educated on all of the history of this country. And that goes back before 1776. That goes back to the roles that Muslims have played in this country since the, the slave trade, the, the transatlantic slave trade and understanding where we fit today and what that looks like when you know your history of yesterday. And so I'm finding myself buying tons and tons of books, talking to people, watching documentaries and educating my children 
my friends and my family, because we did not just get here in 2016. We did not just get here in 2020. So one, we must uncomfortably educate ourselves in our history. We must unify and stand in solidarity with each other. One of the most lonely experiences, particularly representing the community of Islamburg, is that you are standing up fighting against um, violence and threats of violence and often feeling that no one in the world cared, no other Muslim or Muslim community cared. And I know that there are other Muslims who've been victimized who've also felt that no one cared. So we must, as a community and as a people and as those who care about justice, we must stand in solidarity with victims of hate crimes and religious-based um, and violations of, of their human rights. And so this is a, a tall order. This urgency is real, it's a tall order, but we cannot get there from here unless we do that work. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all so much for being with us. I think um, this conversation, I mean, I, I certainly learned a lot and I hope um, everyone that heard it uh, also benefited from it. Please take a moment just to give us your feedback before you log off, uh, just a very quick poll on your screen and please uh, sign up for our mailing list so that you know about our next webinar um, and follow us on social media. Thanks a lot.